and welcome to the Alabama Public Health Training Network. I'm Brandon Vaughn with the Alabama Department of Public Health. Thank you for joining us today for our program, Breast and Cervical Cancer Screening, Keeping Pace with Advances in Prevention and Screening. If you have a question about anything being discussed today, please call or email during our broadcast. The phone number and email address are on your screen now and will appear again later in the program. Also, the handouts, sign-in sheet, and evaluation are all available online. You will need to register for this program in order to access those materials. Continuing education credits have been approved for nurses and social workers for this program. In order to receive credit for this training, you must watch the entire program, then complete and return the sign-in sheet and evaluation. While content may continue to be relevant, CE credit will only be awarded for one year for nurses, expiring on July 1st, 2020, and two years for social workers, expiring on July 1st, 2021. If you are watching this program on demand and want to receive a social work CE certificate, you will need to complete the social work test and send it in, along with your sign-in sheet and evaluation. If you are watching this program live, there is no social work test required. For social workers, if you're watching this program live, it qualifies for classroom hours. If you're watching on demand, it is considered non-classroom hours. Before we get started, I would like to introduce our presenters today. Dr. Donna Lynn Dias, professor in the Departments of Surgery and Physiology at the University of South Alabama. And later in the program, we will hear from Dr. Jennifer Young Pierce, professor of interdisciplinary clinical oncology at the University of South Alabama and senior staff physician for cancer control and prevention at the Mitchell Cancer Institute. Welcome, Dr. Dias. I know you have a lot of information to cover today, so let's go ahead and get started with your presentation. Thank you. You're welcome. So what I would like to discuss about is, talk about is the inequality of breast cancer. So oftentimes patients and their family and friends come in and someone has a diagnosis of breast cancer and they're trying to make all breast cancers equal. So what I would like to talk about is why breast cancer patients and get different treatments and why every breast cancer is not the same. And so one of the, we're gonna, these are some of the topics that we're gonna cover. I want to talk a little bit about statistics we're going to discuss genetics because so oftentimes now uh, people have questions about genetics. We're going to talk about risk assessment for the development of breast cancer, and then we're going to talk about what receptors mean in breast cancer. So with respect to statistics, you know, every patient is an individual, but in this day and age, one in eight women will get breast cancer without any high, considered any risk factors. So one in eight looks at about 12% of the population. One in eight seems high, but on the other hand, we have to remember that seven out of eight women will never get breast cancer. And so 87% of the population never will get breast cancer. But one in eight is certainly a high number. And another important thing is that everyone thinks that they have to have that they are safe if no one in their family has breast cancer. However, only about 10% of women do have a family history of breast cancer. So that means that 90% of the women who develop breast cancer cannot walk in the door and say, well, my mom, my sister, I had a family member with breast cancer. So negative family history does not let you uh, out of getting the disease. So now, what's your probability? We talk about one in eight women will get breast cancer. That means over your lifetime. And the truth is that the older you get, the more likely you are to get breast cancer. So if you're a young woman and you show up with a breast mass or a breast complaint, it's probably not breast cancer. However, it can occur. There, I see women in their 20s get breast cancer. However, your incidence is very low. So from birth to age 49 years, your chance of getting breast cancer is only about 2%. Um, from 50 to 59, it's 2.3. But once you hit 60, we're 3.5%. Or one in 29 women will get breast cancer. And over the age of 70, up to one in 15. So again, over your lifetime, your chance of getting a breast cancer is one in eight women, or about 13%. Now, so statistics, you need to use them whatever way is beneficial to communicate with patients and their families. And so distribution, when people present with breast cancer, breast cancer can be confined to the breast, 
it can be breast and involving the lymph nodes under their arm, and that would be considered regional disease, or it can be widespread at the time of diagnosis, where it's already spread to lung, liver, bones, brain, or some other part of their body. So distribution, when people present with breast cancer, about 60% of the people, their breast cancer is confined to their breast alone. Then about 30% of those people will have it already spread to the lymph nodes under their arm. Well, the importance of this, if disease is confined to the breast alone, then at five years, only a, about 1% of those people will be dead at that time. So that is a big emphasis to patients. Let's catch your disease early. If we catch your disease when it's confined to the breast alone, then there's a 99% chance that you're gonna be alive five years from now and disease free. Now, on the other hand, is metastatic, is spread disease a life sentence, a death sentence that you know, you're not gonna be here in five years? Well, certainly your risk of dying is pretty high, but still 20 something percent of people will be alive at five years. So the five year mortality, when it, even when it's spread is 73%. Now, let's talk about living and dying. Mortality means your chance of dying, but on the other hand, survival is are you gonna be alive? So if we take our mortality from 100%, that's gonna give us our survival rate. So if we take the same statistics that I just gave you, and again, that you present 62% are gonna be confined to the breast. Well, that says that if 1% mortality, that at five years, 99% of those people are gonna be alive. And we want to use this fact to emphasize why people should undergo screening mammography. Let's catch your disease early. And then, your chance of being alive when it is spread is 27%. Well, you can use this as an encouraging fact to those people who do present. Unfortunately, they'll show up and they say, why should I get undergo any treatment? My disease is already spread to my lungs. Well, even with metastatic disease, 27% of those people can be alive at five years. Now, I want to talk a little bit about genetics because in this day and age, we know so much more about genetics than just do people have BRCA1, BRCA2, and it's been all over the news with some uh, very well-known people who undergo genetics testing, and that has popularized a lot of people coming in and people feeling like, I need to be tested. You know, cancer runs in my family. What does this really mean? And people will come in and ask for genetics testing when they really don't qualify, and they also don't understand the implications implications of genetic testing and so they'll walk in and go do I carry a gene or you know what about my family so let's talk a little bit we want to talk about who should actually be referred for counseling to a genetics counselor and then now instead of just testing specifically for breast cancer genes BRCA1 or 2 what is panel testing well the genetics in cancer what we know is that about five to 10% of, of cancers, not just breast, but about five to 10% of malignancies overall are likely due to some genetic mutation. And there's 600 genes that have been identified that if you have a mutation in those genes, you are at increased risk to develop a breast cancer, or to develop a cancer. So the most common genetic syndromes that we know about would be those involving breast cancers and colon cancers. And so the ones we think about with breast and ovarian cancer would be BRCA1 and BRCA2, and those with colon cancer would be those with Lynch syndrome. So what we know is with BRCA1 mutations, about one in 300 women would carry a BRCA1 mutation, about one in 800 would carry a BRCA2. However, those that are Ashkenazi Jewish, about one in 40 women will carry a mutation. And the significance of that could be that if you do carry a BRCA1 mutation, your chance of getting breast cancer could be quoted up to close to 90%. Um, so it's important to know who might carry a genetic mutation because those people truly would be at high risk. Same thing for colon cancer about one in 400 people will have um, a, a mutation that would be resulting in Lynch syndrome. Now, there are several other hereditary syndromes that 
or pop that are thought to increase your risk and so I won't go into great details but all these if you have one of these syndromes you're likely to develop a cancer now who should be referred to the genetics counselor everyone that walks in the door you know and says hey I'm worried um, doesn't need to see a counselor and the truth of the matter is there are not that many counselors around and available so is it worthwhile to send someone to a center and there are ways we look at that so you can easily go to NCCN guidelines and it will clearly tell you which patients should uh, consider being referred to a counselor and who would be considered high risk and if you look at NCCN it will give you some guidelines to go on so clear-cut indications for a genetics counselor if I have someone that comes in with a cancer at a young age and when we consider young young is less than 50 and particularly those the development of a breast cancer thyroid sarcomas the ones you see listed on the slide if a patient walks in with a new diagnosis of one of these malignancies and they are diagnosed at an age younger than 50 those people should be referred to a genetics counselor and would be a candidate for some genetic testing on the other hand if you have a patient come in who has multiple primary cancers for instance a patient comes in and you find out they've got breast cancer and because you're a diligent uh, provider you find out they've got breast cancer ask them have they had colonoscopy screening and you send them for screening and find out they've got a colon cancer those people have more than two primaries those people merit referral um, or you know lung breast colon uh, lung but more than one primary or if a patient has two or more close relatives and when we say close typically we're referring to primary relatives like mom dad sister brother or if you have a family member come in and say there are numerous ca cancers of different types in my family my dad had melanoma my mother had thyroid cancer my brother had a colon cancer those patients also likely meet criteria for referral to a counselor now how about some different cancers that have a high chance of having mutation any patient that walks in with ovarian cancer has a significant uh, consideration for a genetic mutation so if you've got an ovarian cancer those people meet criteria to be tested by the same token if you've got a medullary thyroid sarcoma retinoblastoma the other cancers that I've listed here on the slide on the other hand if you get a colonoscopy and more than 10 adenomas are identified that patient would meet criteria now so if we look at just what are the top 10 cancers more, most likely to have a mutation I've listed these right here there's too many to remember but anytime if you see one of these patients they likely might have a genetic mutation so we used to only test very specifically for diseases and with breast we only tested for BRCA1 and BRCA2 now what is done is called panel testing when somebody undergoes genetic testing they interview the patient and they find out what are the malignancies are known in their family if they have one more than one malignancy um, so if someone comes in and said well I had melanoma my brother had melanoma my mother had breast cancer and they find the different malignancies and then they put that information together and they figure out which panels need to be tested and so what they do is test for a number of genes to determine if there's mutation in them and what has been found that you know instead of just BRCA1 and BRCA2 for breast cancers there are at least 10 other genes that might predispose a woman to getting breast cancer PALB2, CHECK2 mutations those don't put people at as high risk to develop breast cancer as a BRCA1 or BRCA2 but there it places the patient at significant risk so with respect to hereditary cancer panels there are different labs in this day and age that offer uh, panel testing and what you do is you identify the type of cancer that a patient has and then they figure out which panels they should be tested and which genes should be tested for and it all becomes very complicated and that's why many of these people that really are at risk should be referred to a genetics counselor who can determine which panels they should be tested for so
the problems is, should everybody be t undergo genetic testing just because they have a cancer? Well, no, because if you test patients and they do not carry a genetic mutation, or if you just test people randomly, then the fact that they don't have a mutation gives them a sense of comfort. I'm never going to develop a cancer. And that's clearly not true, because we know that there are too many cancers that we have not identified all the genetic mutations that are out there, and we don't know the significance. And we think you're safe, but many of the cancers do not. We have not identified a mutation. And so it gives people a false sense of security. On the other hand, if you do test positive, then your family members can be overwhelmingly afraid and panic because they think they're going to get a breast cancer or a colon cancer. So it can b work both ways. So there's sp very specific criteria, and there a lot of thought has to go into testing patients. We also, when somebody has different mutations, we're learning more and more with time about the different mutations. But right now, there are many mutations identified, and we do not know the significance of those. And it, like I said, it can cause a great emotional impact. It's very um, hard on a young woman who walks in at 21 years of age, and she's been told her mother has a BRCA1 or a BRCA2 mutation, then the young woman is afraid they're going to get breast cancer or they're going to get an ovarian cancer. When do they need to get married? When do they need to have children? Do I need to have my breast removed and my ovaries removed? And so there's a lot of an emotional impact with identification of a genetic mutation. So what about coverage? Testing is also expensive. And so right now, Alabama Medicaid does not cover genetic testing, but we clearly know a lot of our patients that have Medicaid and are covered by Medicaid do need and merit testing. And so there are some companies that will help out, and the counselors are, again, are uh, very knowledgeable about which companies will help. Now, what about their clear-cut indications, and when should our, if you as a provider, when should you order some genetic testing? Well, the easy things to know would be if you as a provider, if you're the medical oncologist and you have a patient that you identify cancer, the medical oncologist typically will refer the patients for genetic testing and also have the inside track to a counselor. But the patient that comes in without cancer and just says, do I need to be referred? Well, you need to uh, look at certain guidelines on who needs to be referred, and this is when you go to NCCN and you want to provide some counseling to the patient about really should you get testing. Well, we do have some risk assessment tools to figure out who should be tested. This breast cancer genetics referral screening tool, all of these you can go online and easily look for patients and provide the data. Some of the information when you want to test a patient and risk assess them to see if they should be identified, some parameters you want to know about the patient, you need to know age, height, weight, rage, their race, their age at menarche, age at first birth. So when you interview a patient, you find out these parameters, and then you find out somewhat about their family history, knowing who their primary family members mother, sister, daughter, who had cancers, secondary family members, and then also ask about the paternal history, who's had cancer on the father's side. With this information, then, you can use one of these risk assessment tools that I've listed. And the breast cancer genetics referral screening tool is the first one we want to mention. If you use that website and look it up and then enter that information, that you've collected on the patient. And then ultimately, once you put that data in, you can then print out for a patient and find out, and either the patient will be screened as negative with low risk or high risk. And then it tells you what to do with that patient, and you can actually print this piece of paper off for the patient and say, well, what does a negative risk mean? So this is very useful to the patients to be able to say, look, your chance of carrying a gene is low, or on the other hand, it's high in what to do with that information. Now, another risk assessment tool that we want to talk about is Tyrocusic. Tyrocusic is very helpful to me in two ways. One, um, when I am interviewing a patient, I want to know 
what is your risk of getting a breast cancer in your lifetime? And do you qualify for any advanced testing, any advanced imaging? How do I manage the patient who might be considered high risk for the development of a breast cancer? And particularly in this day and age, we have women walk in and go, I know I'm going to get a breast cancer because my mother and my sister got it, or my aunt got it, or my cousin got it. And so with Tyracusic, we can actually come up with a scoring system to figure out who might really be at high risk for the development of breast cancer, and then how do we manage those patients, and how do we categorize their risk? Well, again, you need certain parameters, agent menarche and the other uh, parameters that I've listed here. So you interview the fa patient, and you collect this data, and again, family history, and then you can easily go online, and all of these sites are free, but you can download the software. And so this tool is very easy to download. It takes very limited amount of time. And what will crop up is this worksheet. And then what you do is enter the data that you've collected. You know the woman's age, the agent menarche, and the other parameters, including height, weight. You can interview, you can enter their family history. When you're doing the Tyracusic score, if for whatever any of these questions, if you don't know the answer, you just leave them blank. So if you don't know the age of menarche, you just simply leave that information blank. But then ultimately, when you've entered all of the information that you know, then you come up here in the top corner on the right and hit Calculate Risk. The nice thing about Tyracusic is if you do know the family history, it's going to as you're entering data on family, it's going to actually print you out a little family tree there, and then you ultimately calculate the risk. And so then you can also print this page for the patient. And what it does is when you do Tyracusic, it categorizes that patient, and it gives you both a risk of developing breast cancer in 10 years as well as a lifetime risk for developing breast cancer. It also calculates for you the risk that they might carry a genetic mutation. So all of that information is very, can be very helpful to you as you manage patients. Now, as a provider, how do I use that information? Well, for me, I look at that lifetime risk of development of breast cancer, and then I know best how to counsel that patient and how to screen and survey that patient every year. Now, the final one we'll talk about here is the Gale model, and this is the one that people, oftentimes people are more familiar with Gale. It doesn't require quite as much information to fill out, but it does estimate the risk of a patient developing a breast cancer within the next five years. So Gale model, again, you look online, and it's, again, very easy to fill out, but it will ask you you know, certain parameters, their age, and, you know, these, this information, you're going to fill this out, and this is going to also calculate your risk for the development of, of breast cancer within the next five years. Now, once we've calculated the risk for someone developing breast cancer, how do we use that information? Well, overall, I told you that someone's risk of developing breast cancer is 1 in 8 women, or around 12 to 13 percent. So for, gen for general purposes, when people walk in the door, I'm going to say everyone, every woman is at risk to develop breast cancer, one in eight women. And if we can determine who is going to get breast cancer, one in eight women gets it, that's just without any risk factors at all. So how do I manage the patient who has no increased risk? This is the woman who doesn't have a family history. You know, people, one in eight women, and this is where you have to emphasize, you don't have to be considered at increased risk to get breast cancer. You know, the patient says, well, my, nobody in my family had breast cancer, one in eight overall. So how do I manage that person who is at a normal risk to get breast cancer? Well, they should start mammography somewhere around the age of 45. Depending on whether you go with the American Cancer Society guidelines or the task force guidelines or the American College of Gynecology. The parameters all are a little bit different, but in general, somewhere around the age of 45 years old, women should start undergoing mammography. 
and then depending on whose guidelines, but get screening mammography every one to two years. And for the American Cancer Society guidelines would say that at the age of 55, get your mammogram at least every other year, but if you want to get them every year, that's perfectly all right. The question then becomes, when do you stop getting a mammogram? Patients will walk in and go, I'm 70 years old, I'm probably going to die before I get a breast cancer. The guidelines would be to continue mammography as long as it is anticipated that the patient's life expectancy is 10 years or longer. Well, none of us are God. None of us can exactly predict. But if you have a 72-year-old who's sitting in the nursing home with multiple medical problems, should that patient be put in a wheelchair, transported to an imaging facility every year? Well, no. Um, so you have to use some judgment in this. And I try to have a very educated discussion with patients. If an 80-year-old comes in to me and says, should I keep getting my mammograms? And I quote this for her. I say, you know, in reality, if you're 80 years old, the chance of you being alive at 90 years old is not very great. But if you tell, your, tell me your mother was 102 and your aunt was 103 when they died, then that's a different matter. But if you at 80 tell me that your sisters have all died at 70 and your mother died at 60, then maybe at 80 you shouldn't continue to get a mammogram. Now, again, the population average risk is 1 in 8. What happens when we use that tyrocusic and we decide that a woman is at moderate risk? And this is when tyrocusic gives me a score greater than 12% but less than 20. So what do I do? How do I counsel those patients who are absolutely terrified that they're going to come in and they're going to get a breast cancer, but yet I calculate them and their risk is only about 15%? I need to counsel them. What can I do to help that patient? Patient will come in and say, I want a mammogram every six months, or I want a breast MRI. Do they really merit? Do they qualify? So people that are at moderate risk, and this is the group between 12 and 20 percent, so the standard would be that mammographic screening should start somewhere around age 40. But then what you do is you counsel them on lifestyle behaviors. What can you do to decrease your risk of development of a breast cancer? The recommendations would be alcohol. Limit it to no more than one drink per day. How about losing weight? Can you use this right here to encourage women to exhibit healthy behaviors? Let's lose weight, let's get our BMI less than 28, and let's exercise. Well. If you calculate this patient on tyrocusic and come up with a 15-16% risk, you're entering weight as a parameter, weight and height. So then the patient comes back to you, you say, how about you exercise? Let's see if we can't get some weight off. And if they accept that as a way to decrease their risk of getting breast cancer, then you truly can come back six months later if they've lost weight recalculate them and there you will sh be able to show them evidence that you've decreased your risk of getting a breast cancer. So this is how I talk to patients who are considered at moderate risk. Limit your alcohol, let's exercise, let's look at losing weight because these are lifestyle modifications that we can work on. Vitamin D daily is also believed to help and also with healthy diet limiting red meat intake to more, no more than three times a week. So lifestyle modifications for this group of patients. Now, what about the risk for, what about how do I manage that patient who truly comes in and we do consider that they are high risk for the development of breast cancer? This is the patient who calculates with me doing tyrocusic that their risk of developing breast cancer is 20% or greater. Does that mean they're going to get a breast cancer? No, but we know that they are at high risk, and if they get breast cancer, we want to identify it early. If you stop and think of things on tyrocusic that might increase their risk, this is the one who comes in and says family members had ovarian cancer, 
or close family members had breast cancer, those that have early menarche, or those who have never been pregnant. Those are some of the parameters. And you know, you can't change that. The only thing you can really change really on tyrocusic is your weight, height, BMI. So if someone calculates out that they have a 20% risk or greater that they're going to get breast cancer, what we want to do is do everything we can to catch their disease early. And this is what has to be emphasized to them. So we want to do enhanced screening. We want to emphasize to them that somewhere around 40 years of age, we want to start getting their mammogram every year. And in addition to doing a mammogram every year, we want to do a breast MR every year. And so the way that is best managed is that we alternate those studies every six months. So for instance, if I choose that I'm going to do my patient's mammogram every January, then maybe in July I'm going to get a breast MRI. And what I'm truly trying to do is I can't prevent breast cancer by imaging them this frequently, but what I'm hoping is that if I catch cancer, I'm going to catch it at an extremely early stage, which then increases my survival, and it limits what treatments is going to be required to manage that breast cancer. So those people that are high risk, we accept the idea that, okay, you're going to get a breast cancer, but let me alternate your mammogram and MRI so when you get a breast cancer, we're going to catch it extremely early. Well, is there anything else that we can do in this group? Again, lifestyle behavior modification, watching the weight, limiting the alcohol, limiting red meat intake. Those fit for every patient. And then what about prevention? Can I really prevent breast cancer? Well, the trials were done comparing drugs to moxifen, raloxifen, and then the AIs. Tamoxifen was our first oral agent that we used to treat breast cancer and it is in a very effective treatment for breast cancer. However, tamoxifen has now been shown to prevent breast cancer. Unfortunately, even those women with high risk, very few women will actually take tamoxifen, and in addition, very few providers offer it or will even discuss it. However, tamoxifen has been shown to prevent breast cancer, and um, it is the only prevention drug that we can use in our premenopausal patient. Raloxifen. Raloxifen has also been shown to prevent breast cancer. It does appear to have less side effects and be better tolerated than tamoxifen. Raloxifen, also known as Avista. Raloxifen has been used very often in using people that have osteoporosis and osteopenia. So those patients who are on raloxifen for that indication are actually helping themselves by preventing their incidence of developing breast cancer. The AIs, anastrozole, exemestane, although those also are believed to pre prevent breast cancer, are not very widely used. So in general, although these medications are out there, they're just not used that much to prevent breast cancer, both from providers being reluctant to offer them and patients being unwilling to take them because of concerns about side effects. Um, what else can we do as prevention? Surgery. It is a big deal, but in general, surgery, you're not a candidate for surgical prevention unless you or there is a strong, uh, there is a genetic mutation in the family. So what does risk reduction surgery actually mean? It truly means bilateral risk reduction mastectomies. It cannot prevent breast cancer by 100%. However, those patients who undergo bilateral mastectomies, it is thought that you decrease your risk of breast cancer by more than 90%. Again, risk reduction bilateral mastectomies is typically only done in those patients who have either carry the gene themselves or have a family member, mom, sister, that carries the gene. But risk reduction mastectomies decrease the risk of development of breast cancer by 90%. Now, what about oophorectomy? It's thought that certainly this will decrease your risk of getting an ovarian cancer. However, getting bilateral oophorectomies also decreases the risk
that a patient's going to get breast cancer. So that is that if a patient carries the BRCA1 mutation, we know they're increased risk of development of breast cancer, increased risk of ovarian cancer. So if they undergo bilateral oophorectomies, we're actually going to decrease their risk of getting breast cancer if they do that by age 35. If they carry a BRCA2 mutation and they undergo oophorectomy, you're going to decrease their risk of getting a breast cancer also. So in addition, by doing bilateral oophorectomies, you certainly are going to decrease their risk of getting ovarian cancer, but you're also going to cut the risk of getting a breast cancer. Where we run into this is the young woman who comes in at 30 years old, and she's had two children, and her mother had a BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation, and then she is also tested positive, and she says, should I get risk reduction mastectomies? Should I get risk reduction oophorectomies? Well, here's the data right here. Those patients are going to significantly decrease their chance of getting both breast and ovarian cancer. Now, calculators um, are just calculators. They're statistics, and everybody is not a statistic. The hard part is... You cannot use these calculators for someone who has breast cancer. There's not a calculator out there to tell me, just because you had breast cancer 25, are you going to get it again at 50 or 60 or 70? These calculators are only to be used for those people who do not have a personal history. Now, so breast cancer. Is breast cancer the same in all our patients? Is every breast cancer that we see identical? Or why does one patient get a mastectomy and one patient gets a partial? Or why does one patient get chemotherapy and the next patient doesn't require it? So oftentimes when I have someone come in with a newly diagnosed breast cancer, the, either the patient themselves or their family member or their friend is going to look at me and go, well, my sister got chemo, or my sister did this, or my friend did that. And patients and families want to make all breast cancers equal when they're not. As a provider, how do I manage patients, and what makes breast cancers different? Well, first thing you got to do is someone comes in with a breast mass. It's not breast cancer until somebody takes a piece of it, does a biopsy, puts it under the microscope. Just because you have a breast mass doesn't mean it's cancer until you put it under the microscope. Pathology looks at it and confirms the diagnosis of cancer. And then what they do is they take that, that slide that shows breast cancer, and then they're going to do stains on it, and they're going to further clarify information about their cancer. For me, being a provider, this dictates the treatment recommendations that I'm going to offer to the patient. Things we look at are estrogen, receptors, progesterone receptors, and something called HER2. So what are receptors? When we look at the slides and the pathologist says, I'm going to stain for receptors. Well, cell receptors are little proteins found on a cell, on a cancer cell, as well as a normal breast cell. And it, these receptors provide information on telling these cells what to do, whether to grow or not to grow. The cell receptors predominantly we're going to talk about to start with are just estrogen and progesterone. In a normal breast cell, not a cancer cell, but in a normal breast cell, there are going to be receptors for estrogen and progesterone. These compounds will bind to the receptors and they're going to help normal growth of a, of a breast cell. So that's why at the age of 10 years old, you've got receptors, you start maturing, you start making hormones, and that's why you get the development of a breast. Now, cancer cells, on the other hand, if you've got a cancer cell and those estrogen and progesterone receptors are sitting there, these agents will stimulate the growth of the cancer. So now, what does that mean? Well, about two-thirds of breast cancers will have receptors for either estrogen or progesterone or both. So what that means is that if you have a cancer, and I tell you it is a hormone-positive cancer, 
if I then turn around and give you estrogen, estrogen supplementation, because you're postmenopausal, I'm going to stimulate the growth of your cancer. Well, in addition to that important fact is that if I stimulate the growth of your cancer by giving you estrogen, I can also block that receptor and block the effect of estrogen. So that's an important thing. Another receptor, though, that we want to talk briefly about is called HER2, and that can be a little confusing because we talk HR, and that's considered hormone receptor, but HER2 is human epidermal growth factor receptors. Again, we're talking about breast cells, both normal breast cells and breast cancer cells. So in the normal situation, if you have these HER2 receptors and protein binds, that's a healthy thing. But if you have a cancer that has the HER2 receptors, it makes the HER2 positive cancers grow faster, more likely to spread. Only about 25% of breast cancers will have these increased number of HER2 receptors. So only about one in four breast cancers have this. However, these that have HER2 positive are much more aggressive cancers, and they are going to grow faster. They're more aggressive. So now what happens? If in the normal breast cells, not a cancer cell, HER2 will stimulate, again, the growth of those cells. However, if you have a breast cancer that is HER2 positive, then these cells will grow quickly and divide too quickly and it becomes more aggressive. So too much HER2 protein is a bad thing. Now, this is where it becomes confusing because being HER2 positive can be good or bad. We have a drug called Herceptin, which was the original agent, and now there are a number of other HER2 drugs out there. But Herceptin can block these HER2 receptors. So if you have a cancer that does not have these HER2 receptors, it won't do you any good to take Herceptin. On the other hand, if you have a HER2 positive cancer, then I can give you Herceptin, and I can very effectively treat your cancer. So again, about 25% or one in four breast cancers carries these increased receptors. They are more aggressive. However, I do have an effective way to treat those. So this, again, is another reason why cancers are not all the same. One patient's going to walk in and go, I got chemotherapy. Why does the next patient not get chemotherapy? These are some of the reasons. Because if you have a HER2 positive cancer, we're going to give you Herceptin and chemotherapy. If you don't have it, then the Herceptin is not the right drug for you. Now, so how does that fit, though? Is HER2, being HER2 positive good or bad? If you're HER2 positive, you do have a more aggressive cancer. It is at more increased risk of recurrence and it's more likely to metastasize. It's also found in younger women. But the good news is, is that I can aggressively treat it. How about the hormone positive drugs, or rather the hormone positive cancers? You can either be hormone positive, you carry either the estrogen receptors or the progesterone receptors, then I can give you one of my oral agents. So. What we do then is we look at cancers overall and categorize them. And when someone comes in with a newly diagnosed breast cancer, I'm going to look at both their hormone ERPR status and I'm going to look at their HER2 status. And this is going to help me make treatment recommendations for those patients. So if I am hormone positive, I'm either estrogen, progesterone, or both positive. So here's my combinations with HER2. I can be hormone positive and HER2 negative, hormone positive, HER2 positive. I can be hormone negative, HER2 positive, or I'm negative for everything. And this is what we call a triple negative breast cancer. Those patients who are ER negative, PR negative, and HER2 negative are considered triple negative, and those are our most aggressive breast cancers. Now, again,
How does that mean? How do I, as a provider, decide how to treat patients? If I can block those receptors, blocking the receptors will prevent those hormones from, from binding. I told you that both estrogen and progesterone and HER2 stimulate the growth of both normal breast cells and it stimulates the growth of breast cancer cells. So if you have a cancer and you have a positive for one of those receptors, I can then block that receptor and that is a good treatment modality. With respect to hormones, the list is there. I can give you tamoxifen, anastrozole, letrozole. I can block the effect of estrogen and progesterone on your cancer cells, and those are very effective therapy. If you have a HER2 positive, you have HER2 receptors, then I can give you Herceptin or one of the other agents to effectively treat your cancer. But this is the information on how we use it and why every patient does not get the same treatment. Now, as I said, the most aggressive cancers are the triple negatives. Those that do not carry the estrogen receptor, do not carry the progesterone receptor, and do not carry the receptors for HER2. These are our most aggressive breast cancers. And now, who gets a triple negative breast cancer? Typically, young females, in particular young Afro-American females, are the ones that oftentimes are going to have triple negative breast cancers. About 10 to 20 percent of those patients come in and they're triple negative. It means I cannot offer you one of these hormone blocking pills. I cannot give you Herceptin. So those patients are going to get chemotherapy across the board. We're going to recommend chemotherapy to most of those patients. Their tumors are not stimulated by hormone growth, so I cannot use a hormone blocking agent, not stimulated by HER2. They're more aggressive. They're more likely to sped, spread beyond the breast, and they're more likely to recur. So anytime someone walks in and we say, you have a triple negative breast cancer, we are going to treat those patients more aggressively than any of our other cancers. Okay, who gets it? Anyone can get it. However, it's been found that if you show up and you're made a diagnosis of cancer at younger than age 50, we more likely are going to worry that you're going to be triple negative. If you're African American or if you're Hispanic or if you carry a genetic mutation, more, more of those patients are found to be triple negative. And that's the information I would like to present to you about why every breast cancer that I see is not the same. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you again, Dr. Dias. Uh, if you have any questions, now is a great time to call or send in your emails. If anyone in our audience has questions, let's start with those. Any questions? Dr. Dias, I'd, I'd like to ask about the patients who are, went to stop screening. And that's a bit of a sticky wicket. If you've got a spry, vibrant, or vital 80-year-old who comes in and is getting her mammograms on an annual basis, let's say, wh what do you say to, to a patient like that? She does not have any family history. Does she continue on the course of, of getting her mammography? or how do you I, t I talk to the patient. In a, in a very bold way. If they bring that subject up to me, I think they should at least get a clinical exam. And if they say, I don't want to get a mammogram, and I talk about them, I ask about how old their family members when they passed, and, and then, but the truth of the matter is, a mammogram is not a big insult to the patient. It's not a very difficult study to do. It's covered with Medicare. And so sometimes it becomes a mental game with the patients. If you say, I will see you next year, let's get your mammogram next year, they feel like you believe they are going to be alive in a year. And then they're going to do everything they can to stay healthy for the next year. Now, on the other hand, if they say, I really don't want to get my mammogram, I say, okay, 
just make sure you check yourselves. But for a lot of women, it's a very encouraging thing. It's not an invasive procedure. It doesn't put them through a lot. And so I just try to discuss really with the patient and let them steer me in what direction they want. If they're asking me permission not to get it, I say, okay. But on the other hand, if you sort of get the understanding that they really want to get it every year, I encourage them to get it. Thank you. Dr. Dallas, I have a question. Um, with Alabama Department of Public Health, the nurse practitioners have recently started using the breast risk assessment tools, and sometimes questions come up uh, whether to start those at 35 or 40 or in between, and what the indications might be if you don't start it till 40 or, or you wait. So one of the problems you run into is how do you incorporate mammograms and MRIs and really when to get them? And the problem with doing any of these screening studies is there's a certain false positives to it. So, and this is what the task force that came out and changed the guidelines. Mammograms, when you do a mammogram, you accept the idea that there can be an abnormality that's really not cancer. So you are going to prompt fear, concern, scares. There's going to be biopsies when it really doesn't turn out to be cancer. So there clearly can be a danger in doing too much screening. Um, but typically, across the board, most people would encourage starting mammography at about the age of 40. And the harder thing, too, is what do you do with the MRI? Both in those patients that are young, what if your mom, what if you do carry a gene or mom carries a gene? And, and there's not really good clear-cut guidelines on whether or not, but in general, it's thought that on the younger patients actually do MRs and not so much the push for the mammograms. But then how do you incorporate that, particularly if you screen somebody at the age of 40 and you give them a high risk and you say, okay, your risk of getting breast cancer is 25, but you've, your risk is 25%. You've just walked in the door. I've done a mammogram on you and it's January. Well, you're high risk. Does that mean I need to turn around and do your MRI this month? No, just wait and get them on some sort of regimented schedule so that six months from now, I'm going to do my MR and I'm going to try to regulate and get them on a schedule. Thank you. It's a hard question. What about the risk assessments with the women who have had a personal history? I know there is not a risk assessment. But it, it becomes very difficult, again, because there is no risk assessment. And so what happens is the numbers, numbers are just what they are. And, you know, you can, just like I told you all, you have, you can have absolutely no risk factors at all, and you can get breast cancer, and you can get breast cancer at a young age. But the numbers would say that once you have a breast cancer, your chance of getting a cancer in the opposite breast is 1% per year. So, if you show up at 75 and you have a right breast cancer, well, are you going to be alive at 85? At 85, your chance of having a cancer is only 10%. So really, you're not too much worried about the 75-year-old. How about the 30-year-old that gets breast cancer? Your chance of getting breast cancer is 1% per year. So by 60, you've got a 30% chance of getting cancer. Those patients need to be followed very closely. And the problem you run into is the difficulty and how do you give them a diagnosis? Because if you across the board say, I've got a 32-year-old, I want to do a screening mammogram. You're not allowed to do a 30, and in general, you don't do a 32-year-old, a screening mammogram on a 32-year-old. However, she had cancer at 30. But if I simply send her and say, I'm going to do a screening mammogram, her insurance is not going to allow me to because she's 32 years old. And then I have to be creative, and I have to figure out, can I say, she had breast cancer, or do I still want to give her a diagnosis of current breast cancer? And, and that, the young people, is where it becomes very difficult. Those young people who get breast cancer becomes very difficult 
to figure out how to continue to screen those people. And it's not, I have told you, I clearly said, the calculators do not work in those people who have had breast cancer. But what I will do sometimes, just for my own mind, is I will delete the block. I will not enter on them that they have breast cancer. Now, having LCIS is not cancer. And LCIS is a factor on tyrocusic, and it will markedly increase their risk. It will really put them up there. But LCIS, atypical ductal hyperplasia, atypical lobular hyperplasia, all those parameters fit on that calculator, but not breast cancer itself. So in a young patient, sometimes I will just forget that they had breast cancer, and I will enter all the other parameters, and I will try to see how high risk they actually calculate out. And that's what's really scary sometimes, is you do these calculations, and these patients really were not at risk at all to get breast cancer. Thank you all so much. Thanks again, Dr. Dias. It looks like we don't have any more questions, so now's a good time to take a quick break. Then we will return with the second part of our program. <laughs> 
Welcome back to our program, Breast and Cervical Cancer Screening, Keeping Pace with Advances in Prevention and Screening. Our second presenter is Dr. Jennifer Young Pierce, Professor of Interdisciplinary Clinical Oncology at the University of South Alabama and Senior Staff Physician for Cancer Control and Prevention at the Mitchell Cancer Institute. Good afternoon. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to give you this lecture today. So we're going to talk about cervical cancer in Alabama, screening for cervical cancer, how we in Alabama can provide more services to underserved women, and how we can prevent cervical cancer through vaccination. First, let's present the problem. In the United States, one in four men and one in five women are currently infected with a cancer-causing HPV. That's way higher than not only we thought, but the CDC thought when they did the study in 2017. When we look at what happens when someone has HPV over a long period of life, we know that it causes cancer. Cervix cancer is the most known cancer caused by HPV, but it is not the most common. Oral pharynx cancer in men and women is more common than cervix cancer. So when we talk about vaccinating boys with HPV, we're vaccinating them to prevent HPV-related cancers in men, not just to help prevent cervical cancer. And these oropharynx cancers have outpaced or outgrown um, the rate that they were thought. They're continuing to rise. So why haven't you ever heard of HPV? We know that it is one case out of every 20 minutes and 39,000 people are diagnosed with a cancer caused by HPV in the United States every year. Now this oropharynx cancer, you haven't heard of it because it used to be rare, but there has been a 200% increase in HPV associated head and neck cancers in the last 10 years. These are cancers of the tonsil or the base of the tongue, the really far back side of the mouth where even dentists aren't able to see. So there's no screening test for oropharynx cancer, and the best hope we have is prevention. Just wanted to mention this because so many folks have not heard of this and why we are working so hard to prevent HPV in both boys and girls. But what we know about cervix cancer, at least 13,000 cases in the United States and 4,000 deaths. That means about 30% of women diagnosed with cervical cancer will die of their disease, which is a much, much higher mortality rate than cancers like breast cancer, which are much more well known but have high survival rates. Risk factors for cervical cancer, of course, known positive for high-risk cancer-causing HPV, a history of HIV or other immunosuppression, but do note that that immunosuppression can be folks who have a transplant or on immunosuppressive medication for diseases like lupus and arthritis, and diabetes can count as a form of immunosuppression. And then we have smoking, which decreases the likelihood of a woman being able to clear HPV on her own, and patients who have no recent screening or poor access to care for screening or positive screens. So these are some preventable things that we can work on. In Alabama, our death rate, our mortality rate is one of the highest in the nation. Currently, we rank number one for mortality. That puts us um, at the highest in the country, and there are disparities by race that we continue to combat that have more to do than just access to care. We need to think more about how to treat women um, of all races to decrease this mortality rate. We know that there are differences by county. There are counties with um, more rural populations where access is even more challenging, and rates of high-risk HPV are very high in counties for both men and women, and rates of cancer in these counties abound. So screening for cervical cancer we know is the mainstay of prevention. Screening for cervix cancer with pap test has reduced cervical cancer death in this country by 75 percent, but that reduction is disproportionate in areas that are rural and populations that are disenfranchised and in folks who have poor access to care. So let's look at a case. We have a 32-year-old patient. This was one of my patients in lower Alabama who had two prior pregnancies, two prior deliveries, and presented with a new pap that on her pap test showed carcinoma. What is interesting to note is that her last pap four years ago was high risk. She had an atypical squamous cell, cannot rule out high-grade dysplasia pap test. We do not know what her HPV status was on that pap test. She presented with this squamous cell carcinoma with no symptoms and normal periods. 
we know that for cervix cancer, the reason that we screen is because women will not have symptoms in early stage disease. That's why you have to screen for it. Waiting for symptoms of cervical cancer means you're waiting too long. So the question is, could this have been present, prevented four years ago? First of all, what was her HPV status on that pap test? Did it matter? She should have had a colposcopy either way. Did she ever come back in for follow-up? Why not? Probably because she had two small kids. And what else could have been done if that pap test had been treated at the time as appropriate for a high-grade lesion that maybe was hiding in there? What else could have been done to prevent it coming back as a cancer or to make sure that she was getting treated in the first place? So we know that the natural progression of high-risk HPV can be to cervix cancer, but most folks will regress. So you have a high-risk HPV infection that infects a healthy cervix 90% of the time. So that means 90% of people will have an infection, but at least 40% of people will clear it on their own. Some folks will go on to have a precursor lesion. Most of those are treated in this country with women who present with an abnormal pap and have that pap treated. But 30% of all of those precursor high-grade lesions will go on to cervix cancer. And that is a very, very high transformation rate from precancer into cancer. Now, we know that this occurs at for any HPV test at about a 12% rate for that HPV 16, the most common high risk HPV type, the number one cause of cervical cancer and the number one thing we're vaccinating against, 40% of patients who test positive for HPV 16 will go on to cancer if untreated. So screening is there to detect pre-cancer. The screening doesn't prevent cancer from forming. You actually have to be treated for that precancer to prevent the cancer from forming. So the goal of screening is to detect the CIN3 and prevent the cancer by getting the woman into treatment. And we cannot forget this crucial step. So we know we have very high mortality rates for cervical cancer in Alabama, and yet our rates of pap test screening are equal to the rest of the country. So the breakdown happens not before the pap, although of course that is a common site of breakdown across the country for patients with cervical cancer, but we have a large breakdown between the pap test and the actual diagnosis of cancer where there was an opportunity to treat a woman with a precancerous lesion. So we'll talk a little bit more about what the guidelines are and how to prevent that from happening. So first, just to review, no screening is recommended before the age of 21. The rate of cervical cancer in that population is very, very small, less than one in one million teenagers. And we know that those um, the HPV in a younger woman can often screen, can often clear on its own. And so we find screening in that population less than 21 results in over-treatment of disease that most likely would have resolved on its own, and we, it is not recommended. So between ages 21 and 29, there is not an HPV test that is recommended, and we recommend pap test only every three years, and that three years is important because women need to come back in for follow-up. We certainly are still seeing cervical cancer in the 20s, although most women in that age group are diagnosed with precancer and it is caught early. Now above the age of 30, we recommend pap test and HPV test every five years. And I really wanna highlight here, this is not reflex testing. This means that regardless of the result of the pap test, you also get an HPV test. It's a different checkbox on your form. Look at the form you have in your office and make sure you know where to check. So reflex testing is only testing for HPV if the pap is abnormal, in particular, if it's abnormal for atypical cells. This is different from that because then you know the HPV status of those patients that have a normal pap. And you can tell that woman whether she's high risk for recurrence or if she's safe to wait five years. There is also the option for a pap test alone every three years. This is considered acceptable, but I will tell you this is no better than the screening that we offered 20 to 40 years ago. An HPV test is an improvement on that, and I'll show you that data. And lastly, we do not recommend screening over the age of 65 if the patient has had adequate negative screening with no recent history of dysplasia and is not currently immunocompromised or DES exposure. Those women who don't fall into that category, of course, 
course, are recommended to continue screening into the late 60s and even early 70s. And anyone post hysterectomy is not recommended for screening, but you have to know for sure if the cervix is present or absent. Obviously, if the cervix is present, they would continue to be screened, and whether or not they've had dysplasia in the past. So women who had their hysterectomy for dysplasia are still recommended to continue screening for at least 20 years after that diagnosis because those are the women most likely to get vaginal cancer. Women who've never had dysplasia and have had a hysterectomy have about a one in one million rate of vaginal cancer, and that's why we don't recommend screening. We know that cervical cancer screening only tests for HPV-related disease. It's not a cure-all, though some women come in and say, well, I need my pap to make sure I'm healthy. And we can educate women that a pelvic exam can confirm their pelvic health, but they don't need a pap test, which is a specific test for an STD. And that's how I caution my patients when they request paps out outside of these screening guidelines. So when we look at who is really at risk, we know that persistent HPV, and in particular persistent HPV 16, is the group of people who are at the highest risk for going on to cancer in the years since that diagnosis. And that's why knowing a woman's HPV status, both knowing your own and knowing the status of your patients, helps you to sort people into high-risk groups and low-risk groups, groups that need to continue with a, either yearly or every three-year screening, and groups of women who are safe to move to that five-year spaced out screening. And lastly, we know that the development of CIN2 is 100%, CIN2 or greater, is 100% for folks who test positive for persistent high-risk HPV. So if you have a woman who has tested positive for that high-risk HPV more than two years in a row, it is more likely that she has dysplasia than that she doesn't. And that long-term, the best predictor that a woman will never have dysplasia or cancer is a negative HPV test. And so that's why we really encourage knowing the woman's HPV status is much more important than even knowing their pap status. Pap status tells you how the cervix health is doing at that moment. But HPV status is how you decide if the woman long-term is at high risk or low risk for cervical cancer in the future. So then when we compare the three screening methods, there is cytology alone or pap test alone. And you can see that the risk of high risk of CIN3 plus in that group is the highest among all the people. And so this is again, you had a pap test, it's negative. What's her risk of CIN3 or greater, CIN3 or cancer in the future? And if you only know her pap status, her risk is higher, even if the pap is negative, than for somebody that you have an HPV status on. So we've discussed cytology and HPV co-testing, which has a very low rate of a persistent disease to cause cancer. And then there's primary HPV testing. So talk, let's talk a little bit about primary HPV testing. You can screen only with an HPV test starting at age 25. Some folks do reflex to a pap test. Some folks go straight to colposcopy for anyone who is positive. ASCCP is still waiting to hand out those guidelines after we get more information. And the other thing I will say about primary HPV testing is it's not very widespread because there's only a few, a very few FDA approved HPV tests for this primary screen indication and they are not the most common HPV test in the lab. I didn't take the time for this talk to review the differences between those HPV tests, but it's important to know which one you're offering your patients. And for most folks, that is not an option to do primary HPV screening. So I've only covered that just a little bit. But the point is that cytology plus HPV testing until primary HPV screening becomes widespread, and I promise promise you it will, we need to do this co-testing. So briefly, if you just look at primary high-risk HPV testing, we know that including high-risk HPD HPV carries a 40% decrease in the risk of invasive cancer in that woman's lifetime. And that is invaluable. When a patient comes to me and says, Dr. Pierce, is there a way that I could have been diagnosed sooner? Unfortunately, the, question, the answer is always yes. If you had had an HPV test and we had known this was precancer and we had known in order to treat you, we could have found this sooner. And so that's what we never want a woman to come away with. And we want you to know that HPV testing 
is covered, you do need to make sure you're ordering it correctly. Discussion with the lab or with your rep for this test will help you to make sure that you're ordering it correctly. But HPV testing is covered at least once every five years in all major health insurance plans and it for um, Medicare and Medicaid. So next we know after a positive screen that we send women to colposcopy and on colposcopy both visually and with biopsy we can diagnose women with CIN1, 2, or 3. I didn't put the glandular lesions on here but certainly um, although they are hard to see um, we know that a colposcopy can carry a diagnosis of a pre-invasive glandular lesion or glandular cancer also. And then that colposcopy leads to diagnosis. And lastly, we talk about treatment. So we know in the United States, there are 1.4 million new cases of low-grade cervical dysplasia a year and 330,000 new cases of high-grade cervical dysplasia a year. How does this compare to breast cancer? Well, we'll get back to this a little bit later when we talk about vaccination. But in the United States, there are 240,000 cases of breast cancer. So if you include pre-cancer and cancer for, of the cervix, there are more cases of cervical pre-cancer and cancer in the United States every year than breast cancer. So if you know someone who has had breast cancer, you know someone who's been diagnosed with cervix pre-cancer or cancer. They're just not talking about it. And that's in part due to euphemisms that we use in the office, like we froze abnormal cells or we ablated abnormal cells or we lasered abnormal cells or burned abnormal cells and we don't give women the information that they need to make decisions for their family to really say great news your pap test caught this cervical cancer at stage zero this is a pre-cancer we're going to treat you today with an excisional procedure and we are preventing your cancer today your pap test and hpv test did their job and knowing that they have been diagnosed with this helps women to, to know to show up for their pap test in the future, to know that their family and even their husband is at risk for a future or a pharynx cancer that they can discuss with their physician, and knowing the potential need to vaccinate their family and vaccinate their children. And the more we use euphemisms, it makes it more difficult for women to understand what they have had and what their family needs. So lastly, I do want to say that I strongly recommend excisional procedures for women with high-grade disease in particular. There can be cancers and even early invasive cancers that hide in these lesions that look like uh, dysplasia on colposcopy and an excisional procedure with pathology will really help us to know if that actually was a microscopic invasive cancer whereas a cryo procedure might be okay for low-grade disease it's never appropriate for a preglandular lesion or a pre-invasive um, CIN3. Lastly, a brief mention of new ASCCP guidelines that we anticipate will come out either in late 2019 or early 2020. I just want you to have heard it here first. ASCCP is moving toward risk-based guidelines. And if this looks complex, believe me, it is. And if you thought the previous guidelines were complex, we're adding a level here. So they are gonna use not only the patient's current test, but their past history put it into a computer algorithm risk matrix, which will calculate both her current risk of CIN two or three, as well as her future risk. And based on that risk, we'll recommend to you next steps in management. And it goes down this scale from very high risk for concurrent CIN two, three or greater, all the way down to a very, very small risk that would recommend long-term follow-up. Now you can imagine that on this very complex scale, what they're gonna recommend that you use is your smartphone or a computer where you plug in through an app or a database the patient's current and past history and they will recommend to you a follow-up. So this takes out some of the complication in running through that list of slides one by one to find the one that fits your patient, but it does add that level of complexity of pulling out our phones for every patient, every pap test result with the obvious exception of normal negative. And so I just ask you to be aware of that. There is a reference here to get an early jump on what that's gonna look like and we await further information and the development of these apps and algorithms.
So lastly, I'm going to talk about HPV vaccination after treatment. This is still very early. This study came out just six months ago in December of 2018, but it was the third study to show prospectively that women who'd been vaccinated either before treatment with a leap or after treatment with a leap had a 65 to 80% reduction in recurrence of CIN2 or greater with vaccination. So for any woman 26 and under who's able to be covered for the HPV vaccine and has recently been treated for high grade dysplasia or seen in a colposcopy clinic, I strongly recommend vaccination. And I recommend vaccination for both themselves and their partners. And it is a challenge. Um, we do find coverage between 19 and 26 to be challenging, but we know that the Title 10 and family planning Medicaid are looking into expanding services for HPV vaccination here in Alabama. And we hope to have more information for you in the near future about how to get these women covered. For many women, when I tell them that this could decrease their rate of cancer, they're willing to find the money to get treated. So lastly, the national recommendations for do we do pap testing, do we do co-testing, do we do primary HPV testing, or even look at self-sampling with primary HPV testing is ultimately going to be a decision of population. So not unlike all over the world, there are different strategies recommended in different cultures and different regions. In the United States, we find ourselves with very diverse populations. And even in Alabama, we find that we need different things for different groups of women. So that's why maintaining a practice where all three strategies can be implemented makes the most sense. And that's what we encourage you to look into. So our current cervical cancer screening best practice, of course, includes HPV testing. Again, this is not reflex. You want to know the HPV status of women with a negative pap test. Lastly, if there is high-risk HPV positivity, look hard for disease. It might be hiding there, and that risk that they could go on to cancer is somewhere between 40% and 100%. To consider a look and leap in your practice. So when a woman turns, comes up for colposcopy and is known to have a high grade pap test or persistent high risk HPV, consider a strategy in your practice that instead of look, biopsy, send the patient home, bring them back for a results discussion, schedule a leap and bring them back for a leap that now is three appointments later, consider a strategy where you look and leap. All major ASCCP guidelines for HCL pap, even with a finding of a negative colposcopy, often recommend a strategy of a diagnostic excisional procedure. So this is worth considering. Next, consider vaccination after treatment. It certainly is a very individualized decision, and we hope that women are coming to your office who have already been vaccinated, but if they have not or have not completed the series, vaccination after treatment does decrease their chance of a recurrence and await those upcoming screening guidelines. Now, let's move on to how we can provide more of these services to underserved women in Alabama. Alabama unfortunately received an F in overall grade for women's health and in 2017 was ranked last. We have a lot of work to do, and this is despite women showing up for pap tests at equal rates to the rest of the country. So we know that there is high incidence and even higher mortality rates for cervical cancer despite high participation in screening, and it really seems there's a disconnect between screening and mortality. A lot of this disconnect relates to women's ability to pay for the expensive colposcopy and treatment procedures, and there are new ways that we can get at this. First, the new tool, of course, of HPV vaccination, the rates of HPV vaccination in Alabama are lower than ideal, and HPV testing, as we've talked about. And there is an opportunity here to partner with Alabama Department of Public Health and others for coverage and follow-up of those abnormal PAPs. So for those of you who are aware of this program, I, I know you already know most of this. For those of you who are not, just a, an education on this, the Alabama Breast and Cervical Early Detection Program uses both state and federal dollars to improve access to screening and diagnostic services for women who are uninsured or underinsured. So selecting patients have to be qualify financially. It's a series of five questions that can be done in any doctor's office. We do it at my practice and others. That this must occur before the PAP occurs so that the woman is in, 
enrolled for the program prior to the pap test being done. And then women can be insured but not insured for screening. This is an important component um, to make sure that we are covering all women who um, do not have insurance for pap testing and follow-up. They do have to be reapproved every year. So just because they qualified last year does not mean that they're still in the program. They have to be reapproved and re-enrolled. And the reimbursement is at the Medicare rate. So it's important to, for you to know that it's free to the patient, but in your office or in your practice, you're not providing these services for free. You're being paid for these services through the program by the Alabama Department of Public Health as a grant. So it defrays all of those patients who come to your office, are listed as self-pay, they have the PAP done that day, they cannot afford the PAP test, the PAP test is abnormal, they still owe your office $200 to $400 for that visit, and then they're told they have to pay upfront for a colposcopy ahead of time. Not only could all of that be defrayed in terms of cost to the patient, but your office could have already been paid for the pap test. They could have been reimbursed for the colposcopy. The woman could have been covered for her treatment and therefore her cancer prevented. Rather than her going through the anxiety of a bill that she knows she can't afford, that she wishes she could come for her colposcopy, but she would then take food out of her children's mouths. These are the types of problems that we have in Alabama that prevent women following up for those abnormal paps. So what it does cover, it covers much more than just the PAP. There's a clinical breast exam, PAP, pelvic exam. It does cover HPV testing and the cost of a mammogram, as well as, and this is very important, any follow-up testing for an abnormal, including cervical colposcopy, biopsies, LEAP, cone. Um, and if cancer or precancer is found, emergency Medicaid to cover the cost of any additional treatment, including all the way up to radiation and chemotherapy. And for breast cancer, covers repeat imaging, ultrasound, biopsy, and again, coverage for cancer if cancer is found. It's important to note that say you have a woman who comes in, pays for that pap test herself, and has a diagnosis of low-grade changes. Unfortunately, that woman falls in the loophole where her pap wasn't covered prior to the um, screening being performed, and she does not meet that criteria because it's not a high-grade lesion. She doesn't meet that criteria to have her treatment covered. Our ADPH is willing to work with folks on these individual cases, but it is very hard to get a woman into the program for folks who have abnormal but not clearly cancer diagnoses. That's why it's just so important to get women in before the screening procedure is done. Next, they also cover a counseling visit after that abnormal pap or colposcopy to sit down and discuss the result. Say you thought it was CIN3, you got the biopsy back, it's cancer, she needs to come to me. But you still are covered for a counseling visit to discuss that cancer with the patient and then make that referral. LSO pap test results are covered, but the discussion of biopsy results is often not. And this was just a, a review with providers to say that most of us as providers don't bring women back in for those um, counseling visits. We usually call them on the phone or send them a letter for low-grade changes that are not considered precancer. Of course, leaps and cones are covered, as we discussed, and referral for any treatment and navigation. In addition to this, women who qualify for this ABC program also qualify for something called the Wise Woman Program. Wise Woman is specifically for women who are at risk for metabolic syndrome and covers screenings for heart disease, stroke, and diabetes, including di blood pressure, weight and BMI, lipid panel, A1C, random glucose, health behavior assessment, as well as referrals and follow-ups for health behavior change, linked to community programs, nutrition, physical activity, smoking cessation, et cetera. One of the programs we offer through the Mitchell Cancer Institute is actually culinary medicine, where we bring in women who qualify for the Wise Woman Program and teach them about healthy eating, healthy lifestyle, and how to prepare healthy meals for their families. So there's a lot of opportunities for women to participate in this Wise Woman Program, and we hope that more counties and more um, programs will ask about it and be interested in enrolling to a Wise Woman Program in addition to the ABC.
So what's at stake? Not only the higher mortality rates for breast and cervical cancer, but higher incidence rates as well, higher incidence of late stage diagnosis, the ability to treat preventable cancers for women who present but are financially unable to pay, and that women have the ability to have better health, health outcomes overall. So we don't want women to wait until 65 to be diagnosed or treated for hypertension or diabetes for, because that's the first time they qualify for insurance, but rather to, have to find them at this stage when they're presenting for pap test screenings get their diagnosis of, of diabetes or hypertension, get those diseases under control at a relatively young age, and then prevent the more long-term complications of heart disease and stroke, which are still the number one killer of women in Alabama. We can do better than that grade of F, and we can work harder for women's health. So to make this happen, we need to increase the number of women enrolled in the ABC program prior to screening, increase the number of wise women participants, increase that treatment of pre-invasive disease before it goes on to cancer, increase the follow-up of those abnormal pap tests because we know those women are at risk for recurrence, and we can do all of this through increasing the number of colposcopy providers in Alabama. So if you are interested in being a colposcopy provider for the ABC program, please get in touch with Kitty Norris and the folks here at ADPH who can help you to expand those services across our state. Lastly, let's talk about preventing cervical cancer through vaccination. This is my passion, and of course, I would love it if no woman ever came into my office for cervical cancer again. As you can see, the screening and prevention of cervical cancer through pap testing and HPV testing is incredibly complex, and we can do much better through vaccination of the next generation. So let's talk about another case. This is a, a patient who came to me. She was 27 years old. She had had four previous children. She had a pap that was high grade and a biopsy that showed squamous cell carcinoma. But when you actually looked in there, she had an eight centimeter lesion on her cervix that was outside of the range that we could safely operate on. She had extension onto both sides of the tissues on either side of the cervix and on imaging actually had stage four cancer. So this mother of four, unfortunately, will pass away from this incredibly preventable cervix cancer. So how could it have been prevented? Well, first of all, she got pregnant at 16. So there were multiple opportunities when she was seen in an OBGYN office after a pregnancy, postpartum, and before the next pregnancy when she could have been diagnosed for HPV. Now, do I know if this would have prevented cancer? I don't, but I do know if she had been vaccinated at 11 or 12, that there was a 90% chance it would have prevented the cancer from ever being formed. And that she had vaccination coverage up to about age 19. We are working on expanding that coverage in Alabama up to 26, but there were multiple opportunities where she could have been vaccinated. Even if she'd had one shot at 11 and a second shot postpartum at 16, she would have had a better shot at finding this than how she did. So let's go through the myths. The first, that cervical cancer is just not that big of a deal, and it's not as big of a deal as the other vaccine preventable illnesses, which are much more serious or much more common. So this are all the vaccine preventable illnesses before vaccines were available in the United States on the left, and all the vaccine preventable illnesses now. When I say now to mean 2010, if you look at that graph, it says only 67 measles cases in the United States. We know in this year alone, there were close to 800. So if you don't vaccinate, these diseases come back. So how does cervical cancer compare? Well, in, before pap test, there were 175,000 deaths. This is not diagnoses of cervical cancer. There were 175,000 deaths from cervical cancer in the United States before pap tests were, were, were widespread. How many cases? When you include pre-cancer, 350,000 cases per year. Of course, before pap test, most of these were diagnosed as, pre -can as cancer rather than pre-cancer. How do we compare now that we have pap tests widely available and vaccines widely available for that matter? First, all HPV-related cancers combined at 39,000 are more common than every other childhood vaccine preventable illness with the exception of flu than any other vaccine that's out there. So if you're only gonna vaccinate your child or adolescent with one vaccine to be, prevent the most likely disease they would get, it would be HPV. And this is cancers. There are 80 million cases of HPV in the world, and that balloon would not fit on this screen. So then, 
cervical cancer and pre-cancer, we're still at 350,000. We haven't prevented the cancer from forming. With pap testing, we just find it sooner. We find it as pre-cancer, much more likely than to find it as cancer. So when we look at this, is HPV as serious as every other vaccine that kids get? Yes, definitely. And it prevents cancer. I don't know anybody with cervical cancer. It's pretty rare, right? I think we've debunked this one already. If you know someone with breast cancer, again, including invasive and pre-invasive breast, you know someone with cervix cancer. It's just that most of the time we find it as pre-cancer, not invasive cancer. But nobody's talking about cervix cancer being prevented in their gynecologic, gynecologist's office because of the shame that goes with that diagnosis of HPV. And we need to do more for women to have the opportunity to speak up and rid themselves of that shame. HPV is so prevalent in our population, basically everybody has it or has had it. And in this day and age, it has to be more about knowledge and prevention. What about myth number three? There's not enough time to be sure that the vaccine works. It's only been around for a few years. Well, this myth is debunked. The vaccine has been available since June of 2006. That's 13 years. And it's been in trials for at least seven to 10 years before that. So we're talking about 20 years worth of information. And here's the data. We know it works. So in the group that was vaccinated early on, a 70% decrease. In the group that only half of them got vaccinated because they were older, a 60% decrease. And these numbers are based on Gardasil 4, the vaccine that only had 70% coverage. So it did what it said it was gonna do. The vaccine we have available now is 90% coverage. Next, it prevents genital warts. So the Gardasil vaccine strongly prevents disease in both men and women when vaccinated. And that vaccination status in Australia, they reached 90% vaccination status in the year 2007 after it had formed. That's because one of the founders, one of the um, inventors of the HPV vaccine is Australian. And they had widespread vaccination in schools and they had a significant decrease in disease straight away. You'll see that the green line is the group of folks over 30 who were not included in that vaccination status. Their disease status did not change significantly and that's because they weren't vaccinated. Can we relate this drop in disease to vaccination? Absolutely. Next, in the United States, we see significant declines in pre-cancer of the cervix after vaccination has become more widespread in every group except that group of 30 who is still has very steady state rates of disease because they have not been vaccinated. Lastly, does it prevent cancer? This is the first study. It just came out in late 2018, and we can now say with assurance that the vaccine prevents cancer. In the group of vaccinated women compared to unvaccinated cancers, there were zero cancers in the group of vaccinated women compared to 10 in the unvaccinated group. And this again was with the group of the vaccine that was only 70% coverage. So we're seeing significantly lower rates of cancer in this group across the board. And I think that's worth noting. Myth number four, PAPs are just as good at preventing cervical cancer, so we don't need to vaccinate. Well, first, we know that that's not true, right? 4,000 women a year die of cervical cancer in this country, so we're not doing a good enough job. And rates of PAP testing have not changed significantly in the last 20 years. Furthermore, rates of surviving cervix cancer have not changed significantly in the last 10 years. Despite advances in cancer therapy, we have not moved the needle. So could we just PAP everybody and prevent cancer if we moved that rate of PAP testing up? Unfortunately, no. With PAP testing, we're still only gonna get about 80% prevention. With vaccination only, we get 90% prevention. But with PAP testing and vaccination, we get 99% prevention. And you can see here that if women are vaccinated, there's really not a big difference in that screening interval for five, three, or one year screening. And this is where we have the cost savings that are needed to do widespread vaccination. Myth number five, I have concerns about vaccine safety. We all hear this as providers from moms. I get it from moms in the you know, soccer stands and at the school play. And I can look you in the eye and I want you to look every patient in the eye and say the HPV vaccine is safe.
There are 106 safety studies on 2.5 million people in six different countries. It is as safe as every other vaccine. Not unlike other vaccines, there are information on the internet that question this safety, but you can be assured and clinicians can reassure parents that have concerns that the HPV vaccine is safe. It's safe, it works. We know that that protection lasts for a lifetime. And so why aren't folks getting vaccinated? In Alabama, unfortunately, we still find people are not getting vaccinated at the rate that they are in the rest of the country, and we're working harder on that. Boys and girls can be vaccinated age 11 and 12, can start the series as early as age nine, and girls 13 to 26 and boys 13 to 26 who haven't started the vaccine can finish the series. Why don't people vaccinate? The number one reason that parents give is a lack of knowledge. So it's on us to tell them more about it. But the one I wanna to highlight to you is that it's not recommended. Now this vaccine is recommended by the CDC, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, my organization, not mine personally, but the group of gynecologic oncologists obviously strongly recommends this. It's recommended by everyone. So if that parent relates that it is not recommended to them, it's because a provider hasn't told them that it's recommended. And they wanna hear it from you, from someone they trust, not just from their kid's pediatrician maybe, but also from a doctor that they've been seeing for a long time or a nurse practitioner or a midwife that they trust to say, you know, while I'm doing your pap, let me talk to you about the HPV vaccine. Have you gotten your kids vaccinated yet? And that can open up a door for a conversation that a woman may have not had with her pediatrician. Um, any of these others on here that the child is not yet sexually active, they have safety concerns that they think it's not needed, those are also lack of knowledge. We should be able to deal with safety concerns. There aren't any. We know that it is needed to prevent cancer because PAPS alone won't do it and there is no screening test for oropharynx cancer for boys. And we know that you're supposed to vaccinate before the child becomes sexually active. It actually works better the earlier you give it. That's why it's recommended at 11 or 12, not because we believe 11 and 12 year olds are sexually active, because we know they're not. So these are the reasons to give it. Next, we know that provider recommendation alone is strongly associated with the child actually being vaccinated. If the provider recommended it instead of just offered it, it's a 75% vaccination rate. If the provider said you can have it, but it's your choice, only a 40% vaccination rate. And any provider counts. If you're the OBGYN of the mom or the midwife or the nurse practitioner or the pharmacist or the dentist, of one of these patients, you can recommend this for children and for those adolescents that you're seeing as well. And the NCI came out with a state joint statement, one of the few joint statements of all 70 NCI designated cancer centers. And their statement was, we encourage all healthcare providers to be advocates for cancer prevention and make a strong recommendation for childhood vaccination. We ask providers to join forces to educate parents, guardians, and colleagues about the importance and benefits of the HPV vaccine. So that's talking to you. And we hope that you will incorporate that as part of your practice and as part of your counseling while you're screening women for their HPV status themselves. So how can you champion the HPV vaccine? There's the obvious stuff like giving presentations, sharing medically factual information on social media, recommending it to your patients and families, and connecting HPV cancer survivors to opportunities for them to speak about it. But maybe there's the not so obvious. We have policy changes that we're working on here at the Department of Public Health, including vaccinating in pharmacies, school-based vaccination programs, and quality metrics through insurers and payers to increase rates of vaccination. And of course, coalition building. We have the Adolescent Immunization Task Force here at the ADPH who continues to work on this and networking opportunities. If you'd like to be a part of it, contact us here.
So overall, we know that the burden of HPV-related disease continues to rise in Alabama and in the United States, that screening with pap testing is not enough. We have to add in these new strategies, including HPV testing and vaccination, and we can all do more to improve the vaccination rates. I encourage you to start in your own practice, use social media, build partnerships, and be a resource for your family, friends, and relatives. With that, I'll take questions. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Dr. Peters. Thank you again. Uh, you shared a lot of important information. We have some time for questions, so let's take some from our audience. Hey, Dr. Peters, thank you so much for that most informative, and the update was just fabulous. Um, I work, I'm a nurse practitioner here with ADPH, and um, one of the main challenges that we have in vaccination uh, above the ages of 18, because we have vaccines for children for our population, our resources. So I just wondered if you would speak to any uh, possibility of that becoming a required vaccine, as Australia did, and what our, um, you know, what our progress is on that forefront. Sure. Um, the first thing I will say is everywhere we're having trouble vaccinating above 19. Not only the payment and payer questions, but also who do they present to? Which doctor do they come to or do they come to the doctor at all? And last and most importantly, most 19 year olds are sexually active and have already been exposed to an HPV type that could later give them cancer. And so first and foremost, we wanna do everything we can to get kids vaccinated when they're still covered on the Vaccines for Children program and while they're still seeing a pediatrician. So the goal is really 100% vaccination coverage by 13. That's the goal we're shooting for. Knowing that that would then leave out a whole generation of kids if we only focused on that group, we're working with Alabama Medicaid and the Title X program to look for availability of vaccine stock to go to that group of women who are presenting for um, Medicaid-based family planning services. There can be opportunities to vaccinate postpartum for women, although with the postpartum Medicaid only lasts a certain amount of time. Um, certainly those bills and policies that expand postpartum Medicaid to one year would be helpful because it could include some of this coverage. And um, there are patient services through Merck um, to offer the vaccine to folks who cannot afford it. And a lot of um, navigators and representatives for the vaccine and pharmacists can help connect patients to that program. I do want to point out that folks can be vaccinated by a pharmacist with the HPV vaccine in this state without a physician's order. Of course, if they don't have insurance cover for it, they would pay out of pocket. The vaccine costs about $200 a dose. And um, for folks who are getting vaccinated for the first time above age 19, they do require the three shot series. Um, I didn't cover that in the talk, but just to clarify, if you start the vaccination before the age of 15, you only need two doses. That's including a child who had a dose before 15 and shows up to your office at 19. They only need one more shot to be fully covered. But if at age 19 they've never had a dose, then you would start the series and they need three shots to be fully covered at zero, two, and six months. And so that cost of $600 can be really tough for folks to make. So I will say, get back to us. We are working on trying to get that through um, to the Title X program for folks who qualify for that. Um, but also, we are trying to figure out ways to get increased access through insurance um, for those. And for anyone who has private insurance, all payers um, in this state pay up to age 26. Thank you very much. So no headway on it being required, a required um, vaccine. Correct. So only two states in the nation have it as a mandate, um, Virginia and Rhode Island. And in both of those states passed under a very specific set of guidelines that um, made it reasonable for those states to do. Alabama still has some hurdles to cover. Um, we wanna make sure that it's widely available before we would enact a mandate. We wanna make sure that a mandate is widely acceptable before we would do that. And we wanna answer questions about why a mandate would be necessary because in every way we always try to avoid a mandate when good education and good patient parent and patient decisions can often overcome barriers so that's where we'd like to head at the moment thank you
I had a question about the HPV vaccine after treatment. Mm -hmm. Is it just for women up to age 26, or was that primarily because of the there being someone to cover the cost of it? That's a great question. I will say that most of the studies, including the first study, were looking at the same population that was approved for the vaccine, so just up to age 26. Um, the HPV vaccine is FDA approved up to age 45. So I have been discussing this data with my patients up to age 45 and letting them make a personal decision. Um, and yet insurance coverage has not met the criteria for age 27 to 45. So it is not covered by insurance in that age group at this time, either for public or private insurers. And it really has to be on a case-by-case -case basis with the patient. Um, but some folks really feel like it's important for their family's health to go ahead and get vaccinated after treatment and are making that decision. Thank you. If there are no other questions, thank you again, Dr. Pierce. This concludes our program for today. I want to thank Dr. Dias and Dr. Pierce for being here, and thank you for watching. Please remember that you can refer back to the training and resources anytime on demand. Have a great day. Thank you.